Hi everybody and welcome back to what is I think what part four. So in this video we're going to focus on the meter amp assembly board and this is more than just the meter amp. I mean it's kind of a convoluted thing. All this just to drive the meters <laughs> to give you an accurate representation of the power uh, going to the speakers as long as the speakers are 8 ohms. Yes. So craziness. But anyway um, it also has the regulated power supply that we need for the preamp section, you know, or I should say the pre-driver section, the input section, and so forth. And the transistors that are used on this are all pretty good ones. They're known to be very reliable. So I don't really think we're going to have to replace much of that on this. We're just going to have to do a recap, clean it up. Maybe I will replace these pots, but they should be still pretty good. Uh, th these aren't really hard to adjust for the meters, so we'll probably just leave those alone. But uh, here's the thing. I really enjoy going through schematics, as you saw in the last video, and kind of learning how things work. And one of the reasons that I'm so attracted to the audio things like this is because it's kind of a simplified version of what I used to do at work and we don't do any more as much I should say because things have kind of changed in the industry but I've always liked doing this sort of thing kind of chasing electrons around and uh, this whether you know it or not this is going to be a solder and chat video so two weeks ago I decided that uh, we really needed to clean out the warehouse and I have a pretty big warehouse with you know from from work and we took two or three truckloads we took three truckloads out and I have about one more truckload to go and we disposed of it it just we I scrapped everything I just didn't have room to keep all this stuff and I think some of you who are parts hoarders and things would have had a heart attack if you'd have seen some of the things that I threw out but you know what you can't keep everything and when things get outdated, you know, x-ray equipment isn't like audio gear. It's not something that you want to keep in your house and uh, use. I mean, there there's a little school. There's a, the only school that does training for x-ray that's left in the United States is only about an hour from my house. And they have a small museum. So if anybody ever wanted to see any of the old things out there, you can go there and look. But... Uh, for the most part, I got rid of a lot of stuff. And uh, while I was going through everything, I came across this. <sighs> Let me see if I can even get it all in the frame here. We're going to have to move way back with the camera. You can see this is a scroll. Now, we used to call these the Dead Sea Scrolls. And... This probably dates back into the 1970s, I would think. Uh, maybe the early 1980s. That would be the latest that this would be. This is the way that we used to, they used to draw out schematics for x-ray machines. They were way more complex than they are today because they did a lot of the functions that you see in modern x-ray technology, but they didn't have microcontrollers and things to do these sorts of things. And everything was done at line frequency instead of at high frequency so instead of switching power supplies which are really small you had great big linear power supplies this is just the schematic for one x-ray generator just the x-ray generator that would be the thing that controls the x-ray tube that controls the the exposure time controls the uh, filament current of the x-ray tube and the voltage across the x-ray tube that's all it does it just controls the x-ray tube and just for that one device that one part of an x-ray machine you need this entire schematic and you can see i can look how you can see how thick that is this is probably about 25 feet long or about 20 feet long and what we would do is we would, we would and you can see some of my handwriting from back in the day well, you can't because it's off. You can see that's my handwriting from a very long time ago. 
uh, from when I was working on one of these. This mach particular machine was made by a company. Uh, it was kind of a joint venture. There was a company in Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States, called Picker, Picker X-Ray. And they had a collaboration with a company called, uh, I think they're called uh, Cook and Sturzel, if my memory serves me correctly, and they were based out of Germany. And this machine was actually mostly produced in Germany and then finished up here in the States, from what I remember. And so here's an interesting part of it, just a tiny part of all <laughs> how this thing works. But this is the high voltage the high voltage output section. And you see there's a three phase transformer with your primary circuit. And the primary of the transformer here was controlled, if you go way back, there's a uh, another auto transformer with a variable tap. It's almost like a variac, but instead of a circular variac where you rotate the, the tap around it, it's a linear variac. Okay, sometimes we called those the sledge. And by changing the input voltage to this transformer, this is a thousand to one ratio. So for one volt going in this side, you get a thousand volts on the secondary. And you can see there are two secondary windings. There, and one of them is configured in a Y configuration. The other is configured in a delta and then each one goes into a three-phase bridge rectifier. And what happens is, and you can see the symbol for the x-ray tube here, so what happens is three-phase power, each phase is 120 degrees out of phase from one another. And then there's also a 90-degree phase shift between a delta-wired circuit and a y-wired circuit. So what ends up happening is when you rectify these, these two sets of coils, and turn them into DC. Notice you can't have filtration. In other words, we want DC voltage to go through the x-ray tube, but you can't put a capacitor on there to filter it because the capacitor will discharge. When you remove power away from this primary circuit, the capacitors will still hold that high voltage charge and it will have to discharge into the cap. So it makes it impossible to make a very short exposure. These machines can actually turn on and off the x-ray in very short order, in, in as small as you know less than 1 120th of a second. It literally can go down to, some of them will go down to one millisecond exposures. And they're pretty square looking. And in order to do that, when you rectify these signals, instead of having, you know, in a single phase system, you would have, let me get a piece of paper to write on. Like with single phase, you know, a regular power supply, you have your, your AC sine wave, just single phase. And when you rectify it, if you do full wave rectification, you would have something like this. We call that two pulse, because there's two pulses there. Now, when you take all of these phases and add them together, because each one, you know, you have each one is kind of doing this sort of thing. All right, and I'm doing a very poor artwork. When you rectify them, you start getting something like this. So with this, you would actually have 12 pulses. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And you can see the ripple is very, very, very small, even though you don't have any filtration on it. And so instead of getting this great big, where the duty cycle goes all the way from zero volts to your peak voltage to zero to your peak, it now goes up. And, and this would be 1 60th of a second, at least in the United States. This would be one cycle. This would be one cycle for a 12 pulse system like this. So it would come up here and for that 16 milliseconds, it would be you would have 12 little pulses. So you just have a little tiny amount of ripple up here. And what that does is that allows you to have close to a representative DC signal going into the x-ray tube, but you wouldn't have to have that capacitor in there. Very ingenious how they do it. Also very complex. This transformer 
was actually larger than a washing machine that you would wash your clothes in. And it was full of the, the, the actual iron transformer for this was massive. It weighed about 1,200 pounds and was filled with uh, dielectric oil. And no, they did not have PCBs in them by this time. They used a type of oil called Shell Diala. It was a dielectric oil. And um, all this would be in here. And these were high voltage rectifier diodes. A lot of times they, they were a whole bunch of 1,000 volt or 1,200 volt diodes in series on sticks. They, we called them diode sticks. And you can imagine all the things that have to take place in this because to make this x-ray tube have a constant output at a very controlled input, there's all kinds of feedback loops that have to take place. And that's not being shown in this section right here. And this is called your mid-secondary M1 and M2. And that goes into a metering circuit and all kinds of things get uh, measured through there. So it's a very interesting circuit and you can see all the different things. And I remember working on these. Sometimes it, it would take days to fix them when they'd fail because as you scroll through all this, you can just see how much is going on. You have your space charge compensation. Uh, any of you that work with vacuum tubes understand what space charge is. That's a big thing that we have to deal with. And uh, all the different things for filament boost. Filament boost is something that has to happen to make the, the filament get up to its proper temperature uh, very rapidly. And then you have you have run where the you know where the once it gets up to its temperature it has to be held there. All these things have to come into play, and this was all done with with switches, relays, and with uh, a lot of see all the relay coils down there, and then you get into all kinds of logic gates. So these were extremely com complex circuits. Uh, in their day, and this was actually one of the, one of the more complicated ones. And in the earlier days, when they started going to uh, what we'll call digital logic, they even got worse for a while because remember there were no microprocessors, there was no microcontrollers. Everything was done with discrete logic, and it was absolutely astounding the amount of computer logic they were able to produce with this type of technology. Remember how limited the technology was back then compared to what we have today. It just, it amazes me. I loved this era. Uh, yes, it was very difficult working on these and challenging, but boy, how rewarding it was when you got one of these things repaired. <laughs> and it was a constant job to keep them working. I mean, they had to be at least twice a year you had to go through the entire system, check everything, check all the calibrations, you know, calibrate the units. Calibration was all manually done uh, using an oscilloscope and uh, some invasive and some non-invasive x-ray test equipment. And it took a long time to get these things calibrated in. Today, it's a matter of, you know, going into the calibration mode and holding the hand switch down for five minutes and the machine calibrates itself. You just, val you just validate that the, ca the internal calibration circuit is accurate and you're good to go. Way different than people are spoiled today. They have no idea <laughs> what we used to go through. And remember, this is only the x-ray generator. The, uh, the table and all of the positioning equipment and so forth, all of that was like this as well. So you had these for those as well. Now, again, for obvious reasons, we called these the Dead Sea Scrolls. Schematics were also distributed in what was called bed sheets, and some of them were that big. They were as big as a bed sheet, and you would unfold them all over the floor in the x-ray room, and you'd have to walk around and <laughs> kind of trace through it. Um, and other ones were just these big, thick books where they had the 11 by 17 pages like this, and there'd be hundreds of these pages you know, continued on next page, continued on next page, jump to page 82 and so forth. And they all had these little maps, you know, the, the letter and number system. So they'd go to sheet so-and-so, A4, you know, and you'd look 
and it jumped all over to and those ones I were my least favorite types of schematics I like these all in ones they were easier to follow like a map but uh, I'm gonna keep this because of course this is history uh, and it won't get thrown away but so much documentation that's no longer valid, no longer used. None of these machines exist in the world today, and what good are they? And all the training we went through. I mean, I, I used to... <laughs> some of these machines, you'd go to school for a month, you know, or weeks, just for this one particular thing. And then, there, you know, there's every manufacturer out there used had a different design. And you had to learn them, you know, especially if you were multi-vendor service like I was, you had to learn a lot of different things. So you wonder why I'm crazy. Well, now you know why. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny. I, I got out of this, you know, I got, you know, the newer stuff came out. We started working with this less and less. So that was one thing. And then I got into, you know, running a business and doing a little bit less of the out in the field things. I still go out in the field and I still carry a toolbox I still turn the wrench but not nearly the way I used to you know 20 some years ago and it's amazing how quickly you lose this and you forget things and that's what amazed me the most you know five six years ago when I started playing with audio again because I like this as a hobby how much I forgot already and it's slowly coming back but uh, yeah lots of fun it's a fun career. It's different today. It's every bit as rewarding and challenging as it was back then, but it's just in a different way than it is now. So anyway, I just, you know, this is a solder and chat. I thought you'd enjoy hearing that little story and seeing this. And no, there is no way that I can scan this on a scanner <laughs> if you look how long that is. So sorry, I can't share it online with you all. Although you'll never need it, you will never see one of these generators ever again. I don't think there's any existing anywhere. Uh, maybe in Germany there might be, but I highly doubt it. Nobody would use these. You can't get these parts. The company that does this is no longer in business. They've been sold a long time ago. Uh, all the people that were factory trained on these, other than a few of us, are completely retired. Uh, you know, the, the people that mentored me on this would be some of them would be approaching 100 years old now. And, uh, you know, some of them are still around. They're in their 70s and 80s and long since retired. So, the end of an era. Okay, let's get started on this meter board and power supply board. And really all I'm going to do is just replace the capacitor. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go through and just look at the... Uh, general values and types of capacitors that are on here. I'll go into my bins. I'll get them out. Uh, now, if you were doing a restoration and you don't have parts stock and you want to order the parts, you probably would want to go through the parts list, you know, in the service manual, or go on the board and kind of look at these and make a list so you can make your order. Anything that involves uh, voltage, you know, just... Uh, power filtering or power bypassing whatever you can just use a standard capacitor and I like the 105 Celsius capacitors because they last longer they they just have a longer shelf life and longer use life <laughs> before they wear out um, anytime you see some of these like these orange ones or ones that are in the audio path then you might want to look at using, you know, a much lower ESR capacitor or more importantly, a low noise capacitor. So when they talk about audio grade, that's really all they are. They're low noise and low ESR typically, and that's by purpose because it does affect the sound or it does affect the circuit a little bit. Remember, these are these are for input coupling and they they are in there for isolation of not only of DC but also having some sort of a reactive component to them and they do attenuate the signal with frequency so changing that a whole lot might make a difference and I we saw that a little bit in one of the Marantz I think it was like a Marantz 2240 or 2250 or something I don't remember where 
actually tried replacing these with a film capa modern film capacitors and it actually did change the sound signature you know on the scope and everything and when i replaced it with you know an electrolytic you know a, a low noise electrolytic it changed it a little bit now it was tiny and the average person probably would not notice it or hear it but if you're somebody who has a really good set of speakers, a good listening room that you could hear, and you have better hearing than I do, well, might make a difference. I don't know. Again, I'm skeptical about some of that stuff, but other things that I can actually prove electronically and scientifically, then, you know, I'm all about it. So let's find some caps. I'll get them spread out here and we'll get started. Okay, I hope I stay in frame through this whole thing. So let's start. I'm just going to start removing them one at a time. So, as I said, it was a lot of fun working on all that old equipment. You know, I was really surprised when I made the little comment on the last video. If or two videos ago, um, if any of you wanted to hear a solder and chat, because I didn't know if that was something that people were interested in or not, and I couldn't believe the overwhelming support I had for that, listening to me talk too much. And uh, it's funny, as a YouTube, I, mean, I call myself a YouTube content creator, I don't know, I create something, <laughs> but whatever. Um, it, it's always interesting that the videos that you think are going to be popular are the ones that don't get as much popularity and the ones that you think are just going to be, you know, you throw them out there and, you know, it's, you know, you just half-heartedly put something together and put it up there for some some people that might be interested or not and those are the ones that blow up and <laughs> people really like them and it's funny and uh it's funny my friends and i have a term for that and we call it you've all heard of the butterfly effect right and how you know there's a theory that a butterfly flapping its wings on one side of the world could affect the weather on the other side of the world in some tiny you know, minuscule way. Well, we have a thing called the butter song effect. <laughs> Where does that come from? Well, one of my best friends worked in a music store and worked for another friend of mine. And the owner of the music store had a cousin. And his cousin was a pretty well-established guitar player. And, uh, you know, back in the 1980s, he was really into, you know, metal and all that at the time, because that's what was popular. You played what was popular and what made the money, you know. And he actually was, went semi-professional. He actually was in a band that actually toured for one season with Kiss. Yeah, with the rock band Kiss. And um, neither here nor there. He was really into music. He wrote a lot of music, had a great voice, was a fantastic guitar player. And he came into the music store one day when we were all hanging out and talking. And he said, you know, hey, he had this tape with him. And he said, yeah, here's a demo tape of some of the music I've been working on that I wrote. And, of course, we were... Uh, One that couldn't wait to hear it, you know. So he plays all this stuff, and it was all very good music. I mean, the vocals were good. The guitar, well, of course, was amazing, because he was amazing. And then this one song comes on, <laughs> and it's it had the most amazing riff to it ever. And it had, in addition to the guitar work being fantastic, the bass line just had a hook to it that you just you just it it pulled you into the song you know it was a very upbeat song but it was really goofy and it was called the butter song and uh 
the lyrics he he didn't even sing in it he just spoke the lyrics you know kind of not quite a rap but not you know but it was just i can't explain it and everybody raved over this song and i'm like play it again play it again you know it is like that is the coolest song and he just starts bursting out laughing and he says you know I wrote that song one evening when I was bored, and the whole thing on my 8-track recording studio, it took me all of two hours to record. He said, I just started playing that riff. Uh, you know, he used a, a cheap drum machine pattern, you know, just, you know, and he just, he started playing that riff on the drum, on the bass, and then he started the riff on the guitar, and then did the soloing with it, and then he's like, gee, it needs some kind of lyrics or something. And I guess he was eating a piece of toast. Or <laughs> and he looked at it and he's like, butter. What kind of things do you put butter on? You know, and literally he just basically in between the riffs listed things that you put butter on, you know, wheat, toast, pancakes, baked potato, and it goes on and on. Doesn't that sound like the most ridiculous song you've ever heard? But it had such a hook to it. Everybody loved it. And he's like, you know, all the other songs on this tape, I spent weeks writing and recording and recording over and over again. And he says, the one you guys go to is the, the one that took me 10 minutes that I put no effort into. And it just goes to show you don't know. And we called that the butter song effect. <laughs> You know, the things that you think are the the big flops are the things that turn out to be the most successful things that you do. And it just became like a little cliche or a little catchphrase that we used. You know, when we do something that was insignificant and it turned out to be something a big deal, oh, it's the butter song effect. And videos are quite like that. We see the butter song effect happen in videos, you know. How many videos go viral out there? And you don't even realize it. You know, there are things that the, the person that posted the video never expected that. And all of a sudden, you know, it's big. It's just, I find that so amusing sometimes. And that's how videos go. And even on my little channel, I've seen that happen before. And, uh... It's just, it's really interesting. So anyway, the, the butter, the butter song effect. Let's see if this, if this video has that, because of course I'm putting no effort into it, right? I'm just replacing capacitors and talking about whatever stupid thing comes to my mind and just having fun here been a busy week at work and it's just nice to sit down sometimes and do some mind-numbing things like this just replacing capacitors or whatever you know he had a machine really blow up the other day I mean it was a uh, the DC rail supply it's this one was just only a 240 volt system but the the bridge rectifier blew up and you know those those rectifier diodes in those machines are huge and i can hardly remember ever i mean i've had scrs and things go in you know switching circuits and things but almost never you see the the big rectifiers go on these things cuz they're so robust but it it exploded with force and just we had to order new ones and probably going to be going in I don't know, beginning of, of the week here. I'm going to be going in and we'll have to rebuild that and fix it. And I think what happened was the x-ray tube is starting to go bad and it's starting to arc. And uh, when the x-ray tube arcs like that, that puts a lot of strain on the primary circuit and on this and everything. And that's probably what happened. I don't know. But this thing had an x-ray tube on it from what was it 1995 yeah it was a 1995 x-ray tube and the engineer that went out to troubleshoot it <laughs> calls me up and he says 
this x-ray tube is a year older than I am. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> He's like, yeah. Well, they got their money's worth out of it. And that's another thing. You know, you hear people talk about uh, vacuum tubes in general, how they, they last a really long time, and it's not uncommon to get an old radio, and if you replace the caps on it, the tubes are fine. And uh, same thing, you know. The x-ray tubes are like that. Some of them last a really long time. The main thing that fails usually in an x-ray tube is the rotor, you know, because they have rotating anodes. That rotor bearing will seize up. And uh, when it does, you know, the, the tube will overheat and start to arc. It'll damage the, the anode, the anode target. Some tubes will go gassy and they'll, they'll start to arc. Uh, other tubes, the, the filament will fail, but quite often the, it's a mechanical failure. All right, Let's see if we can keep this up without banging my head off the camera again here. All right, this is a 47 at 16. I know I have those here someplace. There we go. I find it curious that they do such an amazing job of, you know, going, trying to make the meter track logarithmically. I mean, you can see there's even you know, these therm thermistors here, or varistors, whatever you want to call them, and all these things. And it's the meter is still only accurate into a 8 ohm load, so it really doesn't measure the, the wattage or the voltage and current. It's still just a fancy voltmeter uh, with some logarithmic scaling in it. Um, it's really complicated. Pretty much a Rube Goldberg machine, if you ask me. <laughs> and I don't really know why we need such accuracy. I mean, it looks really cool seeing a meter jiggle back and forth, but at the end of the day, I don't look at my meter on my amplifier when I'm listening to music and saying, oh boy, we're approaching 150 watts, you know, I basically say, that sounds too loud, it's distorting, maybe I'll turn it down a little bit, <laughs> but to each his own, I guess, 3.3 at 50, I am totally randomly doing this, and uh, why? Just because uh, I feel like it. I don't get all worried about being all organized about things that are just a hobby to me. You know, I went on to the other day. I was on kind of surfing the web, being bored, killing some time in the evening because nothing good on television. And I went on to the Crutchfield website. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Crutchfield, but they're a uh, they're a big online audio video store. They've been around a long time. They, I mean, they started out with, as a catalog service. That's how long they've been around. And just for giggles and grins, I thought I'd kind of look at what was available with you know modern audio equipment and what the price range was. I was shocked. 
uh, you can still buy very, well, I knew there was high-end equipment available, but I mean like, you know, co you know, mass produced, you know, not boutique stuff that you'd see at an audio file convention, but actually, you know, Marantz and so forth, all these different Denon and all these other companies, Rotel still making things. But I was shocked and amazed at how expensive this stuff was. I mean, I'm always amazed that people will pay thousands of dollars for a used, for instance, a Pioneer SX 1050, 1080, 1980, you know, all those. Or the, a lot of the Marantz gear, they talk about the Marantz tax <laughs> that, that you pay. But when I saw the cost of some of the things, you know, that are being produced today, I mean, it's nothing to drop, you know, three to $5,000 US or way more just on a 100 watt per channel or 150 watt per channel solid state amplifier. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, at the cost of producing, you know, components and things these days, you wouldn't think it would cost that much. But these things are still f fetching huge, huge money. And it uh, just kind of amazed me that, uh, you know, how much, how much money was, you know, people are charging and were willing to pay for this stuff. So it kind of renewed my interest even more in restoring old gear like this because really even at the outrageous prices people are asking for this stuff it's still not a bad deal when you compare it to the new stuff that's out there now i'm not just talking you know and and yes it's it's not all just class d stuff you know what i mean it's actual made in the traditional way that this stuff is you can still buy things like that it's just ridiculously expensive i was at a furniture store the other day and i took a picture of this and if i can find it buried in my photographs i'll put a picture of it up on the screen but <laughs> there's this abomination they were selling in the furniture store it said something like 20,000 watts or something and it was this thing it was like a well, it was really cheap artificial fireplace tv stand things all in one and it had one of those cheap bluetooth you know that you buy on ebay stereos built into it with bluetooth and everything and it, and it said you know 20,000 watts power you know and all this stuff and it was hysterical uh so, yeah, that always cracks me up when people come on, you know. I don't even bother with these little cheap 20-watt amps. I can buy these 10,000-watt ones on my... Yeah, you can. It's, it's what it says, huh? Uh, tell me how that works out. And connect it up to some real test equipment and see what the real power output really is. I think you'll be a little bit surprised at what you find. Or maybe you won't be because you won't know the difference and don't care. I don't know. I'm making a mess of all this. Well, of course I'm disconnecting the wrong one. <laughs> Every video that I do this, you, I do this at least once where I unsolder the wrong thing while I'm talking to all of you. Nice. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, there's that. Good grief. But I'll tell you, they really bent these things over, didn't they? These leaves. Okay. I'm just making sure that the mark marking on the board matches how they're actually on there. This board's very clean on this side. There's no marks or anything on it. So that's a good thing. And again, I don't think this board's going to have a whole lot of problems. I am going to probably redo the power transistors in the power supply section. Because a lot of times, those ones do have to deliver current. 
And because of that, they, they overheat, and with, with age, the gain will start to drop on the transistors. And the more the gain drops on them, the, the hotter they'll run. So you'll notice that like when you replace those transistors on an old piece of gear like this, quite often the, those transistors, the new ones, will run cooler than the uh, original ones, and that's why. You know, when those, when those original ones were brand new, they ran pretty cool as well. But uh, as time progressed and, you know, they kind of went down in gain, and that's what happens with a lot of these transistors. They, the gain drops on them, and, uh, you know, you start having problems. So it's not a bad idea to replace them if you have them, or if you can afford to replace them, you know. That's another pet peeve. I like the, I don't like these things sitting at an angle because it kind of, there you go, makes them bump into some of the other components. A lot of people are like, you need to mark all of your old capacitors and everything. Well, you can pretty clearly see when a, uh, you know, when you have an old capacitor on there versus one of your new ones. Chances are you're not going to use the same type uh, because they don't manufacture them anymore as the ones that are on the board. So it's pretty easy to see. And also the ones that are completely coated with dust like this, you know, 47 at 16. That's another one of these. And you can see I'm kind of bending these leads out to match this lead spacing of the old one. I mean, you can just kind of force them in and leave them sit up off the board a little bit. It won't hurt. But you just don't want to put a lot of force right where it comes out of the, the rubber seal on there. That's kind of can cause problems with them. And that's why I do that, and it just makes them fit in here a lot better. And again, these will last a long time. And this is just a force of habit for me to cut the leads first. Really... You know, with things like capacitors and resistors, it's really not a big deal. The only reason I prefer to do that with transistors is when you cut the end off of the transistor lead, you leave, you leave the tinning off, you expose the copper of the lead, and it is possible for corrosion to kind of wick its way up through there. That, that tinning on the outside of the copper lead of the, of the transistor actually kind of seals it a little bit and prevents corrosion from going in there. Um, at least so I've been taught and I've just always done that because that's what I've always heard. So, all right, let's get these. These are the last, were these the 2.2s at, what were they? Yeah, 2.2. I should have these right here. 2.250, those are it. Let's get these out of here. And again, you don't need a fancy, expensive desoldering station. If you have it, it's good to use it, but you can just as easily and sometimes more quickly just use a desoldering pump or use a solder braid. And sometimes it goes faster that way. And then sometimes you just heat the heat the leads up and just pull them out. And uh, that's a pretty quick way to work too. So all right. Just always making sure when I take these out that the the polarity is marked correctly on the board with how they were originally mounted and double check the value because I have put capacitors in backwards and I have put the wrong value in.
it's easy to do even when you mark everything and kind of double check you can still make a mistake it's possible anybody that tells you they don't probably doesn't do this a whole lot or they do it so much that they're not going to make a mistake and don't you expect to be like that because like me you don't do it enough you know and you're going to make your little mistakes and that's not the end of the world it doesn't really matter also depends on are you doing this for a living or are you doing this for fun uh, if you're doing this for fun for a hobby to waste time then who cares how much time you save or waste or whatever you're the whole point of this is to kill some time you know whereas when you're doing this for a living that's a different story and uh I'm going to mention another YouTube creator out there, and that is Jordan Peer. And, and most of you probably already are subscribed to his channel. If you're not, I highly recommend it. His approach to the repair of this is based upon someone who does this for a living. And it is very educational to see you know, the process of how to properly service these things in a way that they'll they'll work and, and stay working for a long time after you take delivery of it because remember he's got to kind of stand behind his work and so the techniques he uses is very efficient but yet also quality work and uh, I, I did reach out to him a while back and I emailed him because I, I get a lot of you who request you know if I could work on your stereo or whatever and I don't do much of that because like I said I don't take outside jobs a whole lot because I have enough stuff this is just a hobby and I have a full-time business that I run so I asked him if it would be okay if I could recommend him, uh, him to you guys when you ask me and uh, he said it would be okay although sometimes he gets really busy but right now he's kind of in a little bit of a lull and probably if some of you would really like to get a piece of vintage audio gear repaired or restored or something and you have the means to to pay a professional to do it i could not recommend anybody more highly than i recommend him he's a super nice person uh, runs a really good channel there and you can you can just tell from his shop and everything that he he's been doing this a long time. And he knows what he's doing. So you know, pay him a visit and uh, reach out to him. He may be able to help you out if you need a restoration done or a repair done to your precious piece piece of equipment. <laughs> so there's a little plug for uh, Jordan J P Dillon, good guy. There's a lot of good people on, in this community. And uh, a lot of people are getting hung up on YouTube because they're changing a lot of the rules. And it is annoying. I don't like uh, all the ads and things. But you almost have to put ads on if they're going to promote you so that anybody sees you, first of all. And second of all, you got to remember that YouTube is not like a public service. And what's happening here? My hmm. Okay, my soldering iron just whacked out for a minute. So anyway, um, you have to understand about YouTube. They are a privately owned business. I mean, they they don't. Or, you know, they're, they're a corporation. They're a, I should say, the best way to say is they are a for-profit business. I don't pay them anything. Uh, they host the, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of videos that I upload. And I'm a relatively small channel compared to some of the big, big dogs out there, you know. And you got to understand, they make their money off that ads, those ads, among other things. And so if they want to put a couple ads on my videos, well, it's their channel. So that's, that's up to them. Uh, I'm grateful that I can do this and it doesn't really cost me anything to upload or to host this. I mean, 
I have a lot of web services I have to use for work. And I can tell you it's a big expense of my company to be able to, anytime we have to host anything online and use somebody else's server space, is very expensive. And the fact that you can go on to YouTube and upload all this stuff for nothing, and you guys can come watch it, and about the worst thing that will happen to you is you'll get some stupid, you know, <laughs> advertisements. Um, and honestly, if you're a YouTube content creator and you really care that much about that, they do give you some options to opt out of types of materials that you're not comfortable with. So if you don't like things that, you know, that involve politics or religion or you don't like something that involves uh, you know, certain moral things or whatever, you can opt out of those. You know? If you don't want the Viagra ads on your <laughs> channel, you can opt out of that sort of stuff. So, you know... They, uh, they do give you that. So, again, click through it. And I think you can pay for the, what is it, YouTube Pro or YouTube Plus or whatever the heck it is. And I think, and again, I'm no expert on this stuff because I really don't pay attention to it that much. But I think you can actually, if you get that, you can actually not get the ads then. That's, you know, by paying them something every month they will uh, let you watch the videos without watching all the ads, I think. And don't quote me on that. I'm, again, I'm no authority on any of this stuff. As much as I'm into electronics and I loved computers and things in my younger age and all that, you know, I just don't do a lot of the social media stuff. This is about as far as I take it. I don't have... You know, like a X account or a, uh, what is the other one, Facebook or any of that. I don't have any of those. I never will. I, you know, if you want to see me, you can call me or email me if you know me. <laughs> uh, you can comment on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you're a patron, you can directly access me. Uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. But uh, you have plenty of ways to reach out to me if you want to. So, yeah, I, I just don't see a need for those things. But, you know, I think YouTube is pretty fair about it, considering. And uh, considering some of the stupid commercials I've had to watch throughout my life on just public general television, uh, I think we forget about that, what that used to be like. And... Uh, where you have a half hour show and you know every couple of minutes it you know by the time you're done your half hour show ends up only being 15 or 20 minutes long uh, you know i don't think those couple ads that run through the, through your youtube thing are all that bad but i could be wrong and some of you may disagree with that i, I totally appreciate that too but uh yeah All right, so I have, let's see, I need to do this one yet. And then we'll get to the bigger ones. All right. But I will say, being able to do these things really does okay what am i missing here there's one this one is 3.3 at 63 what's this one 3.3 at 100 okay this is the one and i think there's another one on here somewhere that i need to do could be wrong but i may have made a mistake i don't know there was two of them that were 63 volts instead of 50 volt. This one, and I think this one, perhaps. Is it 3.3? Yeah. So I may have to swap this one out, I think. Or was it this one? Oh, here it was. It was this one. Yeah, I had... I put three of them out. I only needed two. 
so I'm good. And I have an extra one out here. Sometimes I'm talking here, I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. But we'll double check our work and make sure that everything's correct. All right. And then I have these right here to go. And we should be good after. And then I have this one I have to do. And it is 2.2. I think that is the, yep, 2.250. And that's a audio grade one. So that is, I am correct. Okay. So I thought that was another 3.3. It's not. So that's the one that replaces this. So I wanted one of those Nichicon golds for this. You know, some of these caps are no longer in production. And the hoarders came out and bought all of them. And there's like nothing left. <laughs> and uh, But there are still other manufacturers of caps out there that you can still buy. You just have to shop around and, and look at the spec sheets. Find the ones that are low noise and low ESR. And uh, purchase those. And they'll work just fine. They may not have the same marketing names, you know, like audio grade and all that, but they're the same cap. As long as the, the you know, low noise, low ESR, low ESL, whatever, you get those specs, it's the same capacitor. It doesn't need to say audio grade or, you know, whatever. Okay, we got four more to go after this, and this board will be mostly done, and then we'll do the transistors. Now I'm just rolling the camera here, so if, uh, yeah, 47 at 80, 100 at 80, okay, so this one's the 47 at 80. I just like to let the camera roll with these ones and then I'll cut it down a little bit if there's too much dead space. And, uh, it's a lot easier to edit. Everybody's got suggestions about how to edit your video or how long your video should be or whatever but my priority sometimes is just is time and sometimes you know splitting videos up into multiple parts and editing them like that and it just takes too long it's easier to make one long video and be done with it uh, so I do that and uh, it's just a matter of convenience to me people forget that uh, you know, not all YouTube creators are doing this to make money as a business. And they're not trying to promote stuff and sell things. And I have a patron page and I did it to filter the number of communications I have to make. And to be more accessible to the people that really want to access me. You know, without having to answer a million emails. And that has worked out really well. I feel bad sometimes for my patrons because, you know, other other channels, you know, on their Patreon channel, you know, they'll do special videos for their patrons or release the videos early for them or whatever. Uh, mine is basically about allowing communication and I don't do a lot of discussion online, but I will do a lot of private messaging with my patrons. And if I'm going to get rid of any gear, uh, especially with giveaways and things, I always do that for the patrons. So, you know, I've had several patrons where I've given them audio equipment that I've done on this channel here in the videos. And... Uh, happy to do it for people that would really appreciate it and could use it. So that's really what 
Patreon is to me. It's it's different than uh, you know what other people might use Patreon for. So that's my purpose for it. Okay, so here is the plus and the minus. Yes. And this is 330 at 100. Look how much smaller. It's a little bit taller, but look how much skinnier it is. You know, these new caps, they've really changed. And this one has actually a 100 degrees Celsius cap. I mean, it's very good. But of course, you know, to say that it's a whole lot better, well, heck, this thing's been in here for you know, 40 or 50, 40 some years. I think that's a pretty good track record. You know, if, if these all last that long, I'll be thrilled. If, let me tell you, if these last 45 years, I'm not going to be around to worry about it. <laughs> so, hopefully the next generation, 40 years from now, will have enough sense to know how to put their own modern components in then, if those things even exist. I don't know. But all you could do is make things nice for the next group, and hopefully they'll do the same for the people following. It's called paying it forward, is what I call it. That's what we try to do. Pay it forward. I do believe that good you do comes back. And you know what? I'm one of those people, I don't care if I get something in return. If I do something good for someone, that's a good thing for me. That's the th satisfaction I get. You know, give a present to somebody because it's wonderful to see them happy that you gave them a present. Not in the hopes that you'll get a present in return. And that's just a... That's just my little way of looking at it. I mean, you know. Okay, what is this one? 80 volts, 100 microfarads. That would be this one. No, that's 100 at 100. Why do I have 100 at 100? Where is my 80 at 100? That's 47 at 80. Did I get the wrong caps out? I did. Definitely. So let me get out my 80 at 100. Okay, now I remember. I don't have an 80... Or no, I'm sorry. I don't have... This is 100 microfarad at 80 volt, idiot. This is 100 at 100. Okay. Now we got it. So there's 100 and 100. I'll put that in. Okay, yeah, I didn't have 100 at 80. I had 100 at 100, which is just fine. The voltage isn't as big of a deal. You don't want to go too much higher on voltage, though. Because if you have a capacitor that's rated for a certain voltage, and then you never bring it up near that voltage, that capacitor will have a hard time staying properly formed. And that affects uh, how that capacitor works. So you always want it to be uh, close to the, you know, to the original capacitor's working voltage. So this one, like I said, is rated for 80 volts, and I put one that's 100 volts. It'll be just fine. Uh, you can go over a little bit like that. Never, ever go under. <laughs> so don't put a 63-volt cap in place of an 80. But it is okay to put a 100-volt cap in place of an 80 when it comes to voltage. But I know some people will say it doesn't matter. You could put a 500-volt cap in there if you want. But no, it won't stay properly formed. Uh, and you'll have issues with that. And it, it does change the... ESR and so forth of the cap when it's not properly formed. It's just the way capacitors work. 
strange things those capacitors are, but that's the way it is. And a lot of people will say, well, I've been doing it that way for 50 years, and so it's, you know, it, it, you're wrong. Well, you may have been doing it for 50 years, but again, you may not have been down the road testing the capacitor to see what kind of shape it's in five or ten years down the road. If you measure those parameters, you might be surprised. But uh, I don't know. Again... I'm one person who doesn't know everything, so I could be wrong, too. And I forgot to cover this one up here. Don't have a support pin on these caps. They're smaller. All right. So, and then this one is incorrect. That's the one that's wrong. It's 100 at 25. This one's 100 at 100. I need to get a different. Yep, 135. I'll put that on. That will work perfectly. Again, the chemistry that they use in these caps today is different. Um, so a lot of the things have changed. That's why the physical size of capacitors have changed. And of course, some of the production techniques they have now. Of course, I unsoldered the wrong pin again. Uh, have really changed. All right. By the way, that one pin that I unsoldered erroneously, did I resolder it? I'll have to go through all that and check while I'm talking to all of you. A hazard of talking while you're working something that I don't know I don't worry about those things you know if something's wrong it'll show up when we test it and we'll troubleshoot it and fix it just not a big deal remember when you're doing something for a hobby don't get all uptight and upset about it it's a hobby you're supposed to have fun and if something goes wrong it's a hobby fix it. Just gives you another direction to go on it. You know? All I know is if I finish this project, it just means I have to I'll be looking for another one to do, you know? <laughs> Actually, I won't be looking for another one. I have probably more gear in the queue right now than I have ever had. I have a large amount of... Uh, projects right now sitting this looks a little bit scorched I'm going to do some measurements on this and see what it looks like here well that don't look right why am I reading like 200k or something on this am I not getting the meter on it correctly no that's I'm either reading across a capacitor, or, I mean, this is yellow, purple, brown, so it's like a 470 ohm, and that doesn't look right. Now, maybe it'll read 470 when I take one leg out, so I'll pull one leg up here, but this one looks burnt. It looks like it's been somewhat abused so if I go from this side to here no that's a bad capacitor or bad resistor I'll be daggone this is the bad resistor so now we got to look at this power supply here we may have power supply problems so I'm going to have to look at the actual diagram here. This goes to 2SD381. Let me get some schematics here and take a look. 
there's an old saying that goes, give me a lever and I'll move the whole world. And I would say, give me a schematic and I'll fix anything, you know. Uh, what a difference the schematic will make. So this is looking at the board from the bottom in this orientation. And when I look at this resistor, it is up here. And sure enough, that is a 470 ohm 2 watt resistor. And that is R40. And if I go to R40, there it is right there. You can see it. And that is right in line with that Q7. So this thing has been abused. So we're going to go through and we're going to rebuild that. Okay. These generally seemed to test okay. This was definitely, this thing is bad. It's shot. So I replaced it with a new 47 ohm resistor. I'm sorry. I just realized that. That's supposed to be a 470. Stand by. What I meant to say was I replaced the 470 ohm resistor. <laughs> hey. And so now checking all the other components here. So far they are testing good with the exception of these two little, what are these? 2SC 1890s. And they just read, the forward drops on them read higher than I think they should. The 2SD381s, and where are all these, you may ask. That's these right here. So you have the Q7 is a 2SD381, and this other pass transistor up here is a 2SD381. I'm going to replace those with KSC2073s. And... These two are the ones that read kind of weird, and they are 2SC1890s, and I'm going to re just replace those with a plain old KSC1845. It's almost a direct replacement for these. So, while I'm at it, I'm also going to replace these three over here, which are these two. Little PNP transistors are going to get replaced with 2N5401s. They were originally KSA893s. And then this pass transistor here, it was a 2SB536, and I'm going to replace that with a KSA940. And all those are over here. And that'll take care of our power supply, hopefully. Okay, the transistors are all replaced. You can see here and here. And one thing to note is these 2N5401s have a different pinout. They go emitter base collector instead of emitter collector base. And so if you have a circuit board that has the triangular shaped holes, you see how the holes are patterned in a triangle, you can just rotate the transistor in the, you know, in the position and it'll, the pins will fit right in. If you have a circuit board where the pins are in a, a row like this, you won't be able to use this because you would have to twist two pins over top of one another. That wouldn't look that wouldn't work out right. So just be aware whenever you're substituting transistors that you always check the pin out and check the physical design so that you know that it'll fit. Even though this transistor uh, internally electronically will work, it may not physically work. So just keep that in mind. Well, it looks like we've wasted another perfectly good hour or two of your time <laughs> on senseless talking. And I'm just going to scrub this board off now like we do at the end of all of our board repairs. And I think this one will be ready to test. And honestly, this was pretty much the last of the amplifier. Uh, the next thing I should be able to do in the next part is assemble all of this and power it up for the first time and see if it actually works. And hopefully, if I did my job right and you all didn't miss any of my mistakes and I didn't miss any mistakes, well, maybe we'll have some luck. 
So, thank you all for coming along for the talk. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And, as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And we'll be back again real soon, as soon as this dries and I get more time for the next video. Stay well, everybody. Take care. Good talking to you. Bye-bye.